Okay, let's get started. So good evening, everybody. And uh, apologize for my voice being a little crusty. I'm actually home with a cold. So, but thanks to Zoom, I'm able to run this program from my old COVID lockdown studio. Remember those? Uh, we want to get started right away. So I only want to mention to you again that when Mark's looking for comments or questions, use the Q&A and I'll relay them. Um, and uh, Mark and I are working on dates for at least one, if not two series in the fall, starting in the fall, probably through the entire fall. And uh, keep your eyes on our e-newsletter. We'll, once we get the details ironed out, we'll be announcing that. And we look forward to seeing all of you uh, when we resume this. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mark and we'll get started. Thank you, Michael. As always, thank you for having me. Thank you all for attending. I get the sense that uh, a number of you are faithful attendees, so I'm grateful for that. I want to begin with a clarification and apology of something that I said last week about the shawl relative to uh, anti-Polish sentiment in the decades leading up to the wall, uh, uh, to the war. I uh, foolishly equated in my construction the Roman Catholic Church's anti-Semitism, which was pretty virulent in Europe for many decades before the Holocaust, uh, with anti-Polish sentiment, which of course I was talking about in the context of Rose saying that she resented that as a Jew, her Polishness was erased and that the women and people on the tram were treated as more Polish than she was. And so I, I said a statement sloppily uh, that suggested that the two great causes of pre-war anti-Polish sentiment were the Nazi party, which is true, and the Roman Catholic Church, which is not. And one of my attendees, who's a friend of mine, pointed out that error. And so I'm correcting it now. I apologize to all of you, whether you were offended by it or not. I, I regret that. So uh, thanks to that friend for giving me the opportunity. So tonight's the end of this multi-part series, eight novels over the course of too many seasons uh, on We Two Are Here, continuing with hyphenated Americans, if you will, uh, and um, female authors, Louise Erdrich, uh, born in 1954, a very prolific writer, nearly 20 novels, children's books, and other kinds of literature, um, married to another prominent Native American author, uh, Michael Doris, who died in 1997. And I think it's fair to say that uh, she, Erdrich, is one of the leading Native American authors uh, in the country. Her father was German, which is where she gets her surname, but her mother was a member of the Ojibwa uh, uh, tribe and partly French. Uh, and uh, the North Dakota, Minnesota line is where uh, she was raised and sets a number of her novels. Uh, I hope to, as I have with some of the other uh, novels in this series, open this more broadly up to discussion because it's a um, enough of a distinctive book that I'd be very curious to hear, and I think others are happy to hear what you have to say about it. So I'm going to make my overarching comments uh, in the beginning, and maybe 15 or 20 minutes in, hope for a lot of discussion among all of you. Um, when Leslie Marmon Silco, a name you may know, published her first novel, Ceremony, in 1977, uh, about uh, a Native American, uh, a reservation and a Native American protagonist. It was the first novel in America published by a Native American woman, and it took until the 1970s, the late 70s. In that novel, there is a protagonist named Tayo, T-A-Y-O. It's meant to be reminiscent of Dao, Tao, the, Japan, the Chinese way, and when I taught that in the 80s to undergraduates at Columbia, there's an important issue in the book where whether that young man who is re returned from the war um, will have the courage uh, not to stand up to a confrontation in the West that's a kind of uh, high noon showdown. And uh, this will only tell you how this gets resolved. I don't consider it a spoiler. But the novel has been around a long time. If you haven't gotten to it yet, 
will consider that this is not fatal. Um, he declines to have that confrontation because his teaching and the ceremony of his initiation into wisdom tells him that it will only add to the sum of violence. And so he stands down, unlike Gary Cooper, with the help of Grace Kelly, we should point out. And to a person in my 1980-something Columbia University college course, every student in the group thought that that was wrong. Every one of them thought the right thing to do was to man up. Uh, they didn't get the novel they had just read. And the example that I gave them in trying to explain, I, I thought most of them would not agree with his choice, but I didn't think none of them would agree. Uh, it's often given as an example that if you if you ask a non-Native American, an average American of whatever background who's not a Native American, how many directions are there? They will tell you four, north, south, east, and west. They may even point when they do it. But if you ask a Native American who was born on the land or raised in a reservation or in a tribal community, they will tell you five, north and south, west and east, and up and down. Uh, well, let's say six, uh, because the non-Native American is thinking in terms of representation, a compass and a map, two-dimensional. But a Native American, I'm not being sentimental now, I'm not being, oh, they're so exotic and so interesting. Uh, they don't think of a map in place of the land, they think of the land. Uh, and that's an important insight into any Native American novel, like children, and I don't mean that Native Americans are childlike, but they have an innocence and simplicity in their embrace of animals, of nature, of the transcendental, belief in ghosts, in the mythic. Uh, social historians have suggested that one reason why white children taken captive by Native Americans in the 19th century were reluctant to return to their families when peace was broken, brokered, that's part of the plot of the excellent novel News of the World from some years ago. They suggested that the reason they were reluctant to come back is that Native American culture was very conducive to children. They respected nature. They believed in the invisible. They loved animals. They respected animals. And although they could be savage in war, they had a very strong work and family ethic. And so the social historians have suggested that these children, sometimes taken as young as two and three, when they got to be seven and eight, nine and 10, did not want to go back to the culture they didn't know because they were happy where they are. So one of the things that's striking about this book is it takes place on the stage of an important period in American history that's not known to most people, including many Native Americans, what came to be called the termination era from 1953 to 1968, which is very detailed in the book, all of it true, she fictionalizes the characters in the book. She fictionalizes partly the figure based on her grandfather, the Thomas that's a sur surrogate for her grandfather. But what she says about the hearings is true, and she has an afterward that tells you how devastating it was. Uh, the American government, uh, with the help, uh, of course, and uh, under the insistence of uh, uh, Arthur V. Watkin, who was a Mormon, which is significant for reasons I'll explain. He was Republican senator from Utah, 1947 uh, to 1959, and his passing out of Congress was part of the reason the termination period ended. But what the American government basically did is say, we're going to do you Indians a favor and make you white people. We're going to remove any of the markers uh, that demote you from full American citizenship. And the cost of that is we're going to relocate you to cities so you can learn how to make a good living. We're going to send your children to white schools that don't teach Native American culture. Oh, and by the way, the land uh, that we said would be respected uh, under the various treaties we've had with you, that's no longer yours. Uh, that's for us to worry about. And they called it 
uh, termination. And as you know from the novel, uh, that's the kind of thing uh, like the notion that the Chinese government sends you to a re-education camp, which of course is not re-educating you, it's erasing you. Uh, and so the corporate, the multinational, the governmental use of language to cover up the unpleasant, when the Atomic Energy Commission had to figure out when nuclear reactors were coming online, what they should put in their manual, which would be open to the public, about what they should call a meltdown of a nuclear reactor, they came up with a spontaneous disassembly. A spontaneous disassembly. Uh, can you imagine? Uh, remember when we used to call them garbage men and now women, and then they were sanitation engineers. So this termination, uh, which was meant to be, was, was pitched as a termination of demoted rights, was actually quite the opposite. So one of the things this book does is it opposes the language of the bill, which of course is um, devoid of emotion and filled with misrepresentation. And against that is the entire weight of the novel. Thomas and his remarkable humanity his connection to family of several generations, his consulting, for example, with his father when he wants to think through how he can best face down the committee, the various things that happen to people who are connected either by blood relation or sexual interest or just through the tribal connection. Like several of the other novels we've read in recent months, uh, it's loaded with vignettes. There are 96 chapters in this 440 page novel. That is each vignette is fewer than five pages. That's not a typical novel. You may have noticed, and if you didn't notice, I hope you will look back and take a look. More than a third of those 96 chapters begin with a person's name. Several of the chapters are called Who? Who? And you may remember that one of the things that Thomas wants to know when he decides that he has to oppose the bill is who was in charge of it? Whose bill is it? Because Thomas works in a world of persons, not just um, uh, bodies and politics and uh, anonymous, faceless people. He needs to know who, that the novel has a third of its chapters begin with the names of persons, tells you something significant. And if you're looking for motifs, if you were students in my uh, college course, and you can be happy that you're not, and I can be even happier since I don't have to worry about getting papers from you. But when, you, when such students um, who I've taught my entire life look through a novel for an idea to write a paper about, I do tell them they might consider how chapters begin and end and see if there's any kind of uh, motif or repetition. And uh, again, a significant number begin with the names of people. So in the same way that uh, there are six dimensions, up and down gets added because it's not just a matter of what you see on a map. Uh, the people in this novel understand that one thing that is po is possible is you can have a tribal spiritual leader visit another state, another city, go down to the cities, the Twin Cities, spiritually, to check on the whereabouts of Vera. And this raises the question, are we supposed to accept that as actually true? And I would make this explanation. First of all, the entire novel, in terms of its fiction, is made up. This entire uh, eight meetings and the 16 or so that I've been fortunate enough to have Michael invite me to, uh, they're all made up of make-believe. And I give the example from beloved Tony Morrison's extraordinary novel published in 1987. Uh, if you want to meet that novel on its own terms, you have to believe that a child whose throat was cut by her mother to save her from a life of slavery, has come back from the dead some years later 
aged the age she would be had she lived and is now a young teenager, early 20 something woman with the scar on the neck to show her wound. You cannot say, oh, that's a metaphor. That's a symbol. That's just um, an allegory. Uh, in Toni Morrison's novel, Beloved is that girl. And if you say, how is it possible? How can I be expected to believe in a world of rational common sense things that that's possible? My answer I'm sure would be the same as Toni Morrison. Can you believe that an entire culture enslaved black people for generations, beat them, killed them, mutilated them, sold them in trade like animals, broke up families, thought them they were Christians when they did it, thought they were doing a good thing to these people to help them out of their ignorance and give them uh, a home. Uh, if you can get your mind around that irrational thing in a country built on freedom, 4th of July is coming. If you can accept that, don't sweat a dead girl coming back to life. And I'm not saying that flippantly. I mean that absolutely. The unreality of reality is a feature of human life. Sophie's Choice raises the same question. What is the answer to the question, which of your two children, Sophie, do you want to send to the camps? The right answer to that question is no human being should ever have to answer that question. That's the horror. And so in this novel, the clarity of the threat, the termination threat to Indian culture, again, if you didn't read the afterword, read it before you leave this novel behind of how many tribes were uh, disbanded, how many acres of a million acres of Indian land that had been guaranteed by treaty until this bill reversed it. The clarity of that legalistic ploy is offset by the non-legalistic, emotional, familial, transcendental connections between the people, symbolized partly by how often names are invoked and how generous people are with the networks of who they know. They're not perfect people. Uh, there's been a sexual assault, a uh, woman is degraded, people take advantage of each other, but you have to believe that a spiritual advisor can travel to another place spiritually. You have to believe, as you do in many African-American novels, I think of Sing Unburied Sing by Jasmine, Jasmine Ward, that the dead are actually part of our lives, that ghosts actually exist. And it's one of the ways that novels, American novels in the 20th century, try to correct the deficiency of an emotional dimension, a spiritual dimension, a magical dimension to life that you don't typically find in Hemingway, Fitzgerald, Wharton, Anderson. You do find it in Fitzgerald because he's very close to the land to native peoples, to what used to be called mixed blood people. Uh, and there's a lot of influence of Faulkner uh, on Erdrich. So that's my 20 minutes. I wanted to say that as a kind of overarching introduction. I think the stories individually, the vignettes are interesting, but the enterprise of the book, the trajectory of the book is how does a community of persons with names uh, who respect the land, who believe in a relationship with the animals, who believe they have a relationship with myth, and that it's not just a made up story, but a way of understanding uh, the world and their place in it, how that can offset the threat of governmental um, language. And I will say that Erdrich, who to her credit wrote a novel instead of a history, she could have written a biography of her father, her grandfather, and she could have been absolutely documentary uh, about what happened. But fiction readers would not read that book. And the readership of such a book, A History of the Termination Period, might be broad, but it probably wouldn't be as broad as a Pulitzer Prize winning novelist, uh, a novel by a novelist that is well known. The last paragraph of her afterward and acknowledgement says, lastly, if you should ever doubt 
that a series of dry words in a government document can shatter spirits and demolish lives, let this book erase that doubt. Conversely, if you should be of the conviction that we are powerless, powerless to change those dry words, let this book give you heart. And the last word is heart. And that, to her credit, uh, this is a tremendously um, compassionate, passionate writer. That's the drama of the book. The legal words that can destroy, you know, they were no longer uh, savagely killing Indians left and right, the government, I mean. Plenty of Indians were sacrificed to violence. The Mormons themselves were very um, anti Native American in under the guise of converting them to being white. That's the drama of the book. On the one hand, the dry words that can devastate. On the other hand, the passionate words of people that can remedy or at least address that devastation. So I'm going to stop there and hope uh, a good number of you have something to say, because this is the last in this series. Whatever I do coming back when Michael decides to have me, we won't be doing uh, a continuation of this series, I don't expect. Michael, I leave it to you to be the MC. Crusty, you, voice, crusty voice at all. I think it gives you character, Michael. <laughs> okay, we've got one. The theme underlying this book is startling to me today, and I mean 629-23, when the Supreme Court has just today, in large part, undermined the country's affirmative action initiative in place for 60 years. What a coincidence, I realize this is a thin analogy, but it really struck me while you were speaking. Yeah, I want to say I was very aware uh, when I... Uh was preparing this book over the last few days uh, that that decision was going to come out today. I suspected, like many people, it would be what it is. I want to resist making this uh, a political conversation. I'm not saying that question requires that. Uh, but I will say that in the realm of talking about fiction, the power of fiction is that what is imagined can be stronger than what actually is. You know, that line, that single short sentence by Jane Welsh Carlyle, uh, I too am here at the end of a letter to a friend to say my husband's famous and a man, and he will be a great man that will live in the annals of history. But I too am here. That says so much about rem reminding ourselves that there's not just one kind of person or thing. And I do think that today's decision is another example of dry words or that can have terrible effects and what you hope people of passion and humanity uh, will do. If that seems like an evasion of the larger issue, it partly is, only because I want to make sure we focus on the fiction of the book. Thomas, I think, is a remarkably well-rendered character uh, rendered. I always have great respect for authors who make fiction of characters that are very close to them, in this case, uh, her own relative, uh, and are able to do it without making him overly sentimental, keeping close to the facts, uh, his relationship with family members, uh, his nickname, the fact that he had a stroke and started to lose some of his memory and power of speech, the fact that he was a night watchman and all that suggests about uh, security and attentiveness and faithfulness and being on duty. Um, at one point, uh, Patrice uh, takes the ax when she thinks her father's going to come, not knowing that he's dead, and says, I'll be the night watchman. And she's channeling Thomas in saying, I will be the defender. And the night watchman there is something so much more than the kind of movie stereotype of the overweight fellow. It's never a woman um, who is not particularly attentive and makes his rounds kind of uh, like, a, like a drone. Uh, Thomas is sitting there thinking about his life, what's happening, and writing birthday cards to family members, underlining certain words in the pre-printed cards and adding additional messages of his own. The lovely, lovely ending.
Okay, so we've got the Q and A box open, folks. If anybody's got any other comments to make, I only, I, while while we're waiting for that, I'll just mention one thing that uh, that struck me in your intro part of your comments, Mark, about the number of directions that Native Americans will tell you, and I think it has something to do also with, you know, when you think of North, South, East, West, it's it's very much pragmatically viewing a map of how to go from here to there. Whereas when you incorporate up and down, it's much more evocative of a person who is thinking of their place in the world, which sort of the way an astronaut would think of where they were when they were out in space, that there's you're moving in more directions than just on a flat road network. Right. Also, the person who is aware of up and down is sensitive to the fact that if you're asking for directions, you want to go somewhere. And if between here and there, there's a mountain that will take you an extra two days journey to go around, maybe that should be mentioned. If you're giving someone directions in an urban environment, you may need to tell them whether a street is one way or not. You know, children don't understand representation. Because again, they're innocent of metaphor. So if you saw, say to a child, a six-year-old, don't cry over spilt milk, and there is no milk within sight, doesn't understand at all what you're talking about. That idea of metaphor is used to be one of the tests of whether somebody uh, was sane, uh, whether they understood what's meant by people in glass houses don't throw, shouldn't throw stones, because they were able to abstract something uh, non-literal from a literal situation. But children don't have that skill yet. And in a way, they see things more directly, more tactily, uh, with more feeling. And I, I don't want to be misunderstood. I'm not suggesting that this primitive quality of Native Americans makes them childlike. I think that's a problem when people think that other cultures are endearing or exotic or say that thing again isn't isn't that so cute how they have all these metaphorical words for things well we talk about sitting at the head of the table or fitting a a putting a bill or shouldering a burden we use metaphors all the time but because they're dead metaphors we don't think of it as exotic or interesting or fascinating because we're in the culture we're in and people who say to people in other cultures, I think it's it's so dear that you call uh, that a river horse. Well, yeah, it's a river horse because that's what we call it. You call it a hippopotamus and let's move on. Um, so I, I, I don't want to be misunderstood, but the connection to the land, the lament that maybe people are using the names of people rather than the names of places, losing that connection to the land, in the novel Ceremony, the ceremony refers to a spiritual healing that involves crossing terrain that is both physical landscape and metaphysical experiences. And it's quite a remarkable novel and something to say that it took until 1977 till a Native American woman could get one published. And someone has chimed in on the, on the idea we were talking about with directions. And it's interesting because maybe this is a metaphor or maybe it's actually not one. And it's just a literal description of distance. The expression as the crow flies. Yeah. Yeah. And again, you know, you you can tell somebody's cultural background by the metaphors they use. Um, and of course, metaphors themselves are very powerful. The fact that I say they actually believe in spiritual uh, uh, flight or that they believe that the dead can be seen doesn't mean that Native American culture, remember, we're looking at one tribe in one location in a very narrow window of American history. So we want to be careful not to overgeneralize. But uh, all cultures of any kind use metaphor. And uh, John Henry Cardinal Newman, who I think I quoted to this group sometime in recent memory, said that uh, although we believe in the truth of a syllogism, 
you know, a logical argument. We believe in the truth that two plus two is four. Nobody will die for that statement. Nobody will die to defend that two plus two is four. But people will fight to the death for a metaphor, for a symbol, apple pie, the American flag, the star of David, the crescent moon, and so on. Uh, and that's a powerful thing across all cultures. Um, this tribe has to step up and find the language to oppose the language of legislation. And uh, the, the character who says, uh, Mink, that um, I see it as if we paid a rent to the government and now we're owed access to the land. That's such a brilliant comment and even surprises his fellow Indians because he's taken the relationship and he's made it something everybody can understand. It's just not fair. Forget treaties and federal government oversight. Let's look at basic facts. We made a deal, we give you this and you give us that. And another thing about children is children at a very young age understand the idea of what is or isn't fair even when it's against their self-interest. I don't mean that a child can't act out, but relatively young children, I've been working and living and caring about children all of my life, including when I was a child. Uh, even very young children understand, they may not like it and they might not agree to honor their own sense of fairness, but even very young children understand that certain fundamental things are just not fair. And it's very striking in that pre-hearing conversation when the analogy is made, it's like we paid you rent and you are breaking our lease. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, well, I don't have anything else going on in the Q&A. Oh, wait, I just got one. When someone can connect with another person, it is like a Native, Native American connecting with the most the the moss laden paths he or she walks upon. Yeah, that's very nicely put. Um, I I wonder if uh, the the conversation drying up a little. If anyone who hasn't spoken yet would like to offer, uh, since there's um, nearly fifty of you, uh, how you found the book as a reading experience. That's something. I'm always interested in, even when I teach undergraduates who know or believe they know that they can't be critical of a book because I picked it or because literary history picked it as an important book or because the English department at a particular school made it required reading. How did you find the book as a reading experience? And I mean broader than just whether or not you liked it, although that's a fair thing to say as well. Would any of you like to comment on that? Let's give them a minute. So as we wait, the last two chapters, and again, I numbered them because I have time on my hands, are the 95th and 96th chapter. The 95th is called Roderick, um, and the 96th is called Thomas, and we know about their relationship. Uh, surviving his stroke, Thomas is having trouble with certain words uh, and has to find other ways to say it, wonders whether he's going back to something uh, infantile. Uh, he wonders uh, if he's gonna forget his name uh, and then he remembers his otter name, his name, would there be a time when he wouldn't know himself? I'm gonna read the last two paragraphs while we wait for more um, input. The bones tipped and staggered, assembling into forms and took on shaggy flesh. He's having a vision of global destruction. The grass rippled and billowed like a green robe and animals crossed vast and vaster numbers. The earth trembled in a serpentine rush, blew away and vanished into the sky. We should remember that people at this point in American history 
are living with the bomb, capital B. Thomas remembered the jelly bun in his lunchbox. Now that's a transition that seems almost comic, right? To go from this notion of uh, atomic destruction or maybe providential destruction to remembering the jelly bun in his lunchbox. Rose had made the coffee hot and strong. He, took, he shook his head, wiped his eyes, settled back into his task, underlining words in the birthday wishes and adding his own greetings, forming his letters with precision until it was time again to punch his card and make the last round of the night. So dutiful to his appetite, dutiful to his family, and dutiful to his professional obligation. Uh, there's a line in Twelfth Night, my favorite Shakespeare comedy, where one of the characters says um, of Malvolio, who is the Puritan, the, um, the person who is fills the role of what literary critics called um, the denier of festivities. Uh, he's the one who doesn't want people to have too much fun. Uh, H.L. Mencken said that, um, I think he said it a Baptist, that their fear is that somewhere someone's having a good time, that, that, that they live in fear that people are having fun. So one of the characters whose name is Toby Belch, you can imagine what his uh, appetite gives him, says to Malvolio, whose name is, of course, Ill Will, uh, Malvolio, uh, dost thou think because thou art virtuous, there should be no more cakes and ale? Do you think because you're a serious person, a moral person, other people aren't going to have fun? That ending where he has a vision, which if it were a different novel, could be a downer of an ending, uh, of imagining a destruction that I'm sure is infused by the fact that Thomas in his day, uh, the 1950s, is living under the shadow of the bomb. When Faulkner gave his Nobel Prize acceptance speech, he focused on the fact that how can we write fiction under the shadow of the bomb? He answered that question in his speech, which is available online. But it, it was a big deal. And those of us who lived in that period, when we were counseled to hide under desks in case there was a nuclear blast, when we'd all be... Um, melted to putty, but they did the best they can. Um, think about Dr. Strangelove, that it could go from that image of destruction to the jelly donuts. Just because there's a fear of the bomb doesn't mean there won't be jelly donuts and hot coffee. And then the very quiet homage to his being a person of family obligations and his professional obligations. Any business yet, Michael? I've got I've got one here, uh, Patricia, who says I wasn't always sure where the book was going. It struck me as rather miscellaneous until well along in the story. Yeah, uh, and and uh, if that person's willing to say more, uh, how did they like not knowing where they were going? H how did you feel about being disoriented? Let's say. I'm not trying to put you on the spot. If you don't want to answer, of course, you can just not answer. But or, or anyone else who felt that the novel was challenging. We've seen the challenge of something like The House on Mango Street. Uh, on the Road has its own kind of challenge. Um, well, Patricia says as a follow-up, I have to say I didn't enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah, well, I appreciate the candor. I, I think um, if I were to teach this book to undergraduates, which I have never done and now won't be doing anymore. My days of undergraduate teaching have been over for a while. I think a good number of them wouldn't enjoy it. Um, I can only say that uh, different novels invite you to think differently about what there is to take out of the novel. And so I tried to outline, which doesn't mean it's right and certainly doesn't mean you have to agree with it, the larger drama between the bloodless language of the bill that um, is uh, brooding over the entire novel and the humanity uh, of the families 
which partly has to do with a sort of aimlessness. Early on, you think this is going to be a kind of story about one sister looking for another and a kind of detective story. And then it looks like it might be a love story. Then it looks like it might be a cross-cultural love story. Oh my goodness, are we in the sound? Um, um, uh, I'm blanking on the, the play that I mean. Um, um, the, 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 the Warring Gangs in Harlem that was just remade into a movie. I'm blanking on the name of that great musical. Someone will help me. What side story? Yes, thank you. West Side Story. For a time, it looks like it's going to be that. Uh, for a time, it looks like it's going to be uh, an examination of the degradation that Vera has gone through or the role of the anthropologist who's trying to figure out what to do with her passion for what she wants to study. And if if the answer, if the comment uh, from Patrice, uh, from uh, whoever made the comment about not liking being disoriented is, uh, I'd like something different in a novel. That's a fair statement. The novel's not giving us that. It is partly being all over the map because the novelist is interested in showing you the map. I don't know if you have people in your families, I do, I could give you a list of names, who tell very long stories. I don't mean jokes. I don't mean stories they made up, who remember things from their past, whether it's 30 years ago or last week, and they tell it in excruciating detail. And if you say, hey, grandpa, can you bottom line me? What happened at the end? They get impatient because they're not telling you the story to get to the end. They're telling you the story because the story is what they want to tell you. Her mother, uh, uh, Louise Erdrich, now I'm, I'm now just doubted myself when I said this. Um, no, the, the mother in the book is a storyteller, a singer uh, who tells stories. And a lot of Native Americans that grew up in tribal circumstances remember being told stories. And if we were to say, as we might, I'm sorry, what's the point of that story? As often as not, you'd be told there is no point. The story is in the telling. And that can be frustrating. And of course, we all have the right to say, for my taste, that's not the kind of novel I want to read. But it won a Pulitzer Prize, which does not mean you have to think better of it. Pulitzer Prize is just a group of people like we are. But it does mean that the value of what makes a novel important in America has shifted and it's no longer a matter of plot and outcome and moral or theme or a takeaway. Uh, it may be the experience of, ex uh, of being in a Native American community, which you have to think a very large percentage of the people reading this novel have never experienced, never experienced. And not even on the screen, you know, you've never seen High Noon, someone tells you High Noon is a great movie. I mentioned that earlier in the sense of a showdown. Uh, and you see High Noon and you think, I was never a big fan of Westerns. And while you watch it, you realize, you know, I've seen a lot of Westerns in my life, TV and and um, movies. I, you can't get away from Westerns in America. And I've seen a lot of romantic comedies and a lot of this and that. How many people have experienced in TV, on TV, in the theater, in movies, slice of life, Native American drama. Very, very few. And this is the era uh, when the novels published, when uh, the Indian rights movement, the American Indian movement AIM, uh, when um, Marlon Brando caused a stir by having a Native American woman decline his Oscar, uh, when Russell Means was prominent in American culture, for fighting for uh, the rights of Native Americans, the same decades that the Chicano rights movement and Cesar Chavez, uh, the same decade that Jewish American studies was coming into being in the 60s and 70s, and you could have on Broadway a Jewish play um, like Fiddler on the Roof, which you could not have imagined being on Broadway in the 30s or 40s, even though Broadway 
is populated, certainly financially, with people of Jewish backgrounds, it wasn't thought to be something that the American public would want. And how many people who wouldn't know a Jew if they ran over one got sentimental in listening to Is This the Little Boy I Carried watching Fiddler on the Roof? And around the same time, Cabaret, a much darker musical, came out, which also took a nod at the Jewish American experience that never made it into popular culture before the 70s. In universities in the 60s and 70s, Departments started to pop up that were African American, um, uh, uh, Chinese American, uh, eventually Jewish American, Jewish studies in American universities that had an Anglo background. That sea shift is happening, sea change is happening in the 60s and 70s, uh, around the time some of these books are being published. Again, Leslie Marmon's Ceremony, A Watershed. 1977. That's another book that challenges you to the patients to read a book that's not written in the conventional uh, narrative of American fiction. But, you know, Faulkner was doing it first. And when I have people say to me, you know, really classic novels have a clarity and they run by a kind of rule, I point out to them that most people agree that the first novel in the Western world was Don Quixote. And that's 16th century. And Don Quixote is a wacky book. If you want to talk a book about not knowing where you're going and about the story as its own point and not the end of the story, um, the first novel is a novel that is, for lack of a better term, a term absolutely wacky, brilliant and moving, but it doesn't fit the model, which didn't exist yet, of what we come to think of as a great novel. That's a great point. And uh, uh, the, the key thing to, about Don Quixote is the translate, you'll agree, I'm sure you'll agree with me, the translation that you read of it is absolutely crucial because some of them, some of the translations that came out uh, led people to view the book as, as dry and boring and not interesting. And then there are other translations which turn it into an absolutely hilarious, crazy novel, yeah. you know, and, and complete with, you know, part two, where the characters are talking about themselves as characters in the previous novel. It's, it's an absolutely wild book. So let me say, and this is not a digression, although it may seem to be, the mistake that happened with translators of Don Quixote, it was, fun, it was very early on recognized as an international masterpiece. And when later translators translated it, because Don Quixote was published in the 16th century in Spanish that was Renaissance Spanish, many translators into English kept the Renaissance quality and gave it the feel as if you were reading a Shakespeare play, the thy and thou and hap and whither goest and all of that. And what they lost sight of was to the people who were reading it in Cervantes' day, it was contemporary. And so if you want to translate Don Quixote to a 20th century reader or now a 21st century reader, you shouldn't be translating it into Renaissance English. And the best translations are translations that make it contemporaneous with their own language. That's the idea that sometimes you have to change something to keep it the same. A remarkable book. I recommend it. Great. That's great. That's so him, for the next three or four months. <laughs> Don't twist my arm. I love that book. Okay. So here's another, uh, another comment question. What significance of this model, a story, a journey without a big splashy ending, do you think is related to the fact that this was written by a woman? Yeah, so uh, that question poses its own questions. That is, I don't know if the person who posed that question has their own answer. Um, the stereotypical, which doesn't mean it's necessarily wrong, uh, answer would be uh, historically in culture, women are much more interested in relationships than outcomes. Uh, John Updike, who is one of my favorite writers, but not for his novels, which I don't much care for, 
but for his short stories and especially his criticism and book reviews. He said in one of his book reviews, if life is a forest, women are the trees. That it's women who keep life going in being not just mothers and grandmothers to children, they have that advantage, that is children come out of them. And whether you believe there's actually a biological imperative for mothers to take care of their children, I'm not gonna debate that. It is true that most people in most cultures would agree that the mother has a closer bond uh, to the child. For one thing, the mother is always or almost always known and the father is not. That's why Jewish tradition of uh, the child follows the, um, the Jewishness of the mother because that can be known and the father's identity can be a surmise, at least before DNA testing. Um, it is generally true, certainly in American society, that women are more interested in uh, relationships rather than outcomes. In fact, for generations, literary critics talked without any irony or self-consciousness about novels having a female plot uh, as compared to a male plot. And a male plot would be a typical novel of somebody succeeding, almost always a male. Sometimes it's called a, um, a picaresque novel, a kind of outlaw or wanderer like Robin Hood or um, uh, Huckleberry Finn or The Lone Ranger, all those men have uh, the adventures of Robin Hood, the adventures of The Lone Ranger, of Huckleberry Finn. Someone who is a uh, on the margins of society, Don Quixote is another example, who has adventures. And then the end, something is gained. They get the will, they get the girl, they get the job, they get enlightenment. Um, literary critics for years, not thinking they were gender biased, talked about those plots as male plots. And a female plot was like little women. Oh, my kept my relationship with my sister strong despite marriages and career opportunities. Uh, and they made that distinction. And uh, Bronte came along and wrote Jane Eyre. And Jane Eyre is a novel of education, uh, an initiation novel of a young woman rather than a young man. Uh, she comes into money. She declines a person who wants to marry her because he's lied to her. And she decides later on that she's going to marry him. And she says famously near the end of the novel, reader, I married him, which is to say, reader, I married him. She does the choosing. That's the middle of the 19th century, when in Victorian England, women's status was remarkably low, despite the fact that the nearly longest serving monarch was on the throne, a very powerful figure of both power and maternity in Queen Victoria. Uh, but women's status took a hit in the Victorian period when men started having complete control of their wives' body. Um, do you see 18th century fashions in England uh, and women have necklines that may not show cleavage, but show part of their neck and upper breast in the 19th century in England, the latter 19th century, up to the collar, down to the wrist. Um, the uh, uh, children wore pantaloons, babies that went down to their ankles because you wouldn't want a man to see an infant baby naked calf. Seriously, uh, you know what a Queen Anne desk looks like with its shapely leg. 18th century English furniture did not favor um, table coverings. Uh, wood was very clean. You could see all the legs of a table. Think of a Victorian drawing room. Everything has a cover. You have a heavily upholstered sofa. You have some antimacassars on it. You have a throw rug thrown on it. You have a room overpacked with stuff, maybe a six foot high tree in the drawing room. You had women again covered up from neck to ankle because their bodies became a battleground for respectability. And what happened in the 19th century is respectable people, the middle class took dominance. And you now had women who could be committed to an asylum on the say-so of their husbands. And I'm not being hyperbolic. And so, and Aunt, go back to the question, I do think it's more likely 
that all things being equal, and again, this is stereotypical and generalizing, but sometimes such things are accurate, that women are interested in networking and in connections. She references two of her sisters in the acknowledgments. She writes this book about her own grandfather. She is clearly deeply committed, not just to her family and her tribe, but to Native American peoples. And you don't typically see that in non ethnic literature, I'll call it. Um, you know, people love their families, even if they don't have an ethnicity that shows up on the Census Bureau. Even so called wasps can love their family, love their people, love the land. But it's not the way it typically plays out in our imaginations. Got it. I want to say, by way of wrapping up, that I was very grateful to Michael when I asked him back in the spring if we could reset where the series was going. Um, I was going where it was going partly because of my own momentum. I don't mean that I had to rein Michael in, but Michael was rightly thinking, oh, we're eventually going to get to Philip Roth and Malamud and uh, Updike and other writers we're going to get into the 70s and 80s. And when I looked over what I had done, uh, all proud of it, absolutely, I thought, let's get away from the shadow of the great American novel. Let's add more women. Uh, and let's remember just how diverse uh, communities are. And you know, the, the tricky thing is uh, the books you read in high school and college, the books that uh, the administration, as it were, uh, the educational system tells you are the important books, uh, that shapes your view of what reality is. We, we know reality partly through its representation. And if you only hear male voices talking about male outcomes, the reason why none of my students in that Columbia class thought that Tao was right to refuse to fight these bullies was because they had been bred on stories in which a person stands up and uh, confronts his uh, opposition often a male facing a male, often through violence. Uh, and they're not used to the way being to just back down. And that's why there is that pun on his name, Tayo, T-A-Y-O, that he's learned the way through the ceremony, through the cure, that violence only adds to violence. So I look forward to the next thing we're doing, which is to be announced. Michael's going to work on dates. I will be back. And I will be retired from Yale as of this time tomorrow. And so if you've enjoyed these windows in the background, take a good look because I won't be back here. <laughs> well, so you've honored us with your final moments in your Yale office. Well, I have one more day and you're on your own for that. You'll have to just imagine what I'm doing tomorrow. Well, thanks very much, Mark. Uh, I think this, this was very ambitious. Uh, folks, we never did an eight part series before. We did once a four-part series connected to another <laughs> four-part series some months oh, later. Goodness. But uh, this was great. And if you think about I think I might have said this, but so forgive me for repeating it. But eight weeks is, you know, as I remember going to college, that's two-thirds of a semester of a uh, of an English literature class. And most of the books that we covered, I had not read, and some of them I had not heard of. So I hope you had the same experience of being exposed to some of these things that maybe you'd never heard of or never or never had a chance to read before. So we'll be we're as Mark said, we're certainly having him back. We're putting it together right now, and we look forward to seeing you uh, when we pick this up after the summer. And before long, so the day will come when I will actually be on the grounds of the Wilton Library because we're gonna do something someday that's not gonna be put to a vote. I'm gonna be there and if you wanna see me, you gotta show up. That day is coming. Yes, that's well, also on the agenda. <laughs> Enjoy the summer, everybody. Happy 4th of July. And I hope you all stay healthy and well. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, get better. Thanks, Mark. Everybody have a good 4th and a good summer. We'll see you all again soon. <laughs>